right, so we'll get started with the rest of the morning session with uh, Dora Angelaki, who is here from Baylor. Please give her a warm welcome. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation. I've just realized it's actually my first time at the Picower Institute, yes. So um, this is a little bit of a change in topic from the morning uh, 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 session. So in the past 10 years, my colleagues and I um, have been trying to understand how the brain combines different sources of, of sensory information. And we approach um, this, uh, this question uh, from three perspectives. First, we um, try to understand the functionality of it, what are the functional consequences. And in fact, today I'm going to focus on two of them. I'm going to um, talk about uh, the fact that uh, multi-sensor integration allows the brain to become uh, more precise and uh, increase the signal-to-noise ratio. Then I'm also going um, to show that, uh, in fact, multi-sensor integration, integration also allows uh, stimuli to be less biased or less uh, ambiguous. And of course, in addition to the functional uh, significance, we also try the mechanisms. We try to understand how neurons, uh, primarily in the parietal cortex wh where I'm going to focus today, uh, might be implementing these general uh, functional um, uh, uh, processings. And also, very importantly, at the end, we try to understand the building blocks and the canonical computations that are necessary to be uh, able to generate these functions. So um, we study perception. And uh, like uh, these uh, happy gentlemen um, more than 200 uh, years ago, uh, we uh, conceive uh, that perception is, uh, uh, is a process of unconscious inference. And uh, in fact, both the sensory stimuli, but also uh, the representation in the brain can be uh, corrupted by uncertainty and noise. And so the first hypothesis um, that we are going to be discussing is the idea that a simple way to reduce this noise, this uncertainty, uh, is to combine multiple sources of information. And we do this every day in, in our life. Uh, a typical example is uh, the audiovisual interactions when we hear a noise. Yeah. Uh, somebody saying something in a, in a crowded room, it's hard to understand what the person says. But if we can look yeah. at his lips or her lips at the same time, um, then uh, we can comprehend much easier uh, what the person says. Now, in our lab, we uh, study special navigation. So the task we are going to use today is slightly different, uh, but the concept is similar. Uh, we uh, basically, and we work with rhesus macaques, humans, and more recently also mice. Um, so we passively move the subject along one of different directions um, around straight forward. And uh, during uh, this movement, which lasts two seconds, uh, there are no eye movements. The animal is not allowed to report um, his uh, perception. However, at the end of the two second uh, interval, uh, then two targets appear and the subject uh, um, is instructed to make uh, a saccade to one or the other target to report whether um, his perceived uh, heading direction was to the right or to the left of, head, of straight ahead. So we, because we study multi-sensor integration, we interleave three different stimuli. Um, the first one, we call it the vestibular uh, stimulus, uh, where um, a motion platform passively moves the animal. I call it the vestibular stimulus because I come from uh, the vestibular system. This is how I was trained. But of course, in reality, somatosensory cues are also present. Um, so you can think of this vestibular stimulus as a non-visual. Um, stimulus. At the same time, uh, another set of um, uh, trials uh, present the same simulated uh, movement directions now um, using optic flow. And then, of course, importantly, we have the combined um, trials where uh, both uh, visual and non-visual cues are present together. We quantify the behavior uh, as typically done uh, with such uh, two uh, first choice tasks by uh, plotting the proportion right word choices that uh, the subject makes. 
uh, as a function of the stimulus, and because we use very small uh, heading angles around the zero is straight ahead, we get a sigmoidal function, which we can quantify by fitting a cumulative Gaussian. And it's these two properties that I'm going to focus today, and just to define them, the bias is the mean of the psychometric function, and it corresponds to the accuracy, that is, how big an error the uh, subject makes. At the same time, we also measure the threshold, which I'm going to call sigma, which has to do with the slope, the sensitivity of the psychometric function, and that is also uh, the inverse of threshold is also called precision or reliability. Now, in, uh, uh, of, in real life, of course, uh, we want uh, subjects to be both unbiased and very sensitive, very low threshold. This is an example of a hypothetical uh, uh, psychometric function, which uh, is very accurate. It has zero bias, but it has um, a, a large threshold. Uh, this is another example of a psychometric function, which has a very small threshold now, but it's significantly biased. So it's these two concepts I'm going um, to refer to today. So when we started these experiments, there have been approximately like eight years ago, there have been multiple theoretical and human psychophysical studies that have described that the best way that the brain can um, combine two sensory stimuli is by using this linear weighted sum, uh, where very importantly, the weights are not random, but that they are directly inversely related to sigma squared. And this is also called reliability. And the reason that this is um, the optimal way to, uh, to do the combination uh, is that uh, um, the uh, threshold of the combined estimate, which can be given by this equation, actually predicts uh, an improvement which is largest when the two sigma of the single Q um, uh, stimuli are about the same, then we predict an improvement uh, which is approximately 70% uh, smaller. So this is the theory. So uh, in our experiments, we manipulate the coherence of the visual stimulus, and this is how we manipulate reliability. Uh, in contrast, here you can see basically the, the optic flow stimuli now corrupted by noise. Uh, in contrast, we keep the vestibular reliability, the parameters of the motion uh, unchanged. So this is, I'm going to show you an example psychometric function. These were uh, the first animal we ever trained to do this. These experiments were done a uh, long time ago by a postdoc in the lab, Jong Gu. Um, we measure the vestibular threshold. We measure the visual threshold. In fact, we adjusted the visual coherence such that we can get approximately the same sensitivity, the same threshold such that when we now present the stimuli both together, we can get a steepening of the psychometric function and the threshold which is um, lower. This is just one session. This is summary behavioral data um, from uh, that original animal uh, a long time ago. And the point here to appreciate is that um, this is the single Q mean thresholds. This is what the prediction should be based on this equation I showed you previously, and this is what we got experimentally. Now, in more recent experiments performed by Chris Fetch, a graduate student in the lab, um, he actually interleaved within the same block of trials different uh, visual reliabilities, different uh, uh, visual motion coherences, uh, such that now we can measure um, the uh, threshold uh, a different uh, uh, relative reliabilities. And this is an example I showed you previously. When the single Q thresholds are about the same, then one is uh, the prediction is that uh, the combined threshold will be smaller. And this is what we got experimentally. In contrast now, when the visual coherence is actually high, which means the visual threshold is very small, then um, the prediction and the actual improvement is very small. Uh, because adding the vestibular in this case does not really uh, help much. In addition, what Chris did is that he put the stimuli in conflict, and he was actually now able to measure the weights with which um, uh, the um, uh, brain uh, weighs these two different signals, 
This is the equation I showed to you previously. This is the prediction again. Uh, as we vary reliability, when the weights are about equal, we should expect, uh, when the thresholds are about similar, we should expect the weights to be about 50, 50, 0.5. Uh, in contrast, at high visual coherences, where the visual cue is so much more reliable, then the vestibular weight should be small and the visual weight should, should be large. And this is exactly what our animals showed. So these data suggest that um, monkeys and humans, uh, and recently, actually, these experiments have been extended to rodents. Uh, and uh, the take home message is that uh, uh, when cues are presented together, then the behavior becomes much more sensitive, and also um, the brain appears to reweight uh, different cues as a function of uh, the relative reliabilities. So we were interested um, to understand where in the brain this happens, and most of what I'm going to show you today focus on area MST, which is um, in the superior temporal sulcus, the reason we focused in this area is because neurons uh, in, the, in this area are multisensory, and also because mucimal inactivation leads to behavioral thresholds and um, deficits in this task. I'm also going to show you one slide uh, recordings from the ventral intraparietal area here. So um, a very peculiar result that we found is that there are actually two types of neurons in this area. Uh, one type of cell, which we call congruent, uh, has the same heading direction preference under both the visual and the vestibular uh, stimuli, which makes sense because they both vote in the same direction. Uh, but uh, there is also another group of cells which actually shows the stimuli uh, in different direct, uh, the, the preferred directions are different and we call these opposite. And in fact, we quantified this extent of congruency with an index which varies uh, from plus one for congruent cells and to minus one for opposite cells. And what we found is that if we now record the activity of neurons in area MST and we uh, measure the combined neuronal threshold as a function of the prediction, one should uh, indicate uh, cells which optimally combine uh, the two sensory signals. What we found is that there is a significant negative correlation such that when we look at congruent cells, uh, then we actually see in their properties the signature that we observed in the animal's behavior, meaning that the combined stimulus is... Uh, um, uh, is very similar to the prediction and significantly smaller than the single uh, Q thresholds. In contrast, and that was very surprising at the time, when we look at opposite neurons, then as you can in understand intuitively, we actually see that these cells actually increase their threshold, decrease their sensitivity when the two Qs are combined. And please remember this because I'm going to come back at the end of the talk. So we um, concluded, or I should also mention that similar results were also obtained from area uh, VIP, the ventral intraparietal area. So this appears to be a universal, um, uh, a property that is widespread uh, in uh, the parietal cortex. And in fact, we are un trying to understand the circuit um, that involves all of these areas. But now I want to come back to, um, to the results, the behavioral results that I showed to you previously. This is the experiment that Chris Fetch did for his PhD uh, work. And he trained animals to do this task. These are the behavioral data. And then, of course, based on these previous results, we hypothesized that congruent MST cells actually might be responsible for generating the behavior. And indeed, when we took the activity of all congruent cells he recorded from, and we used a simple linear decoder to predict the population properties, then we actually saw both the threshold and the um, weights to follow exactly what we saw in the animal's behavior, including this peculiar departure from optimality uh, at uh, low visual coherences. So to summarize what I have shown you so far, and this is all published, is that in a multisensory visual vestibular heading discrimination tasks, 
task munchies and humans employ a near optimal st uh, strategy to weigh the choose in proportion to its reliability and that population activity of congruent multisensory cells can predict both the improvement and a precision in precision and the Turing weighting. Uh, work which uh, I do not have time to describe today, it's uh, also published, shows that we have actually followed all of these properties down to the level of individual cells. And in fact, uh, uh, we uh, have proposed that a, a canonical neural computation uh, known as divisive normalization might be involved in this. And again, this is published work. Instead, now I would like to move uh, forward to more recent um, results. So notice that previously I tried to emphasize the fact that the animal is not allowed to make a choice before this um, smooth displacement stimulus of two seconds um, is finished. And uh, now I want to go back and highlight the fact that everything I have shown today uh, up to now have used a fixed delay task. In reality, though, this is not, not, not how we make decisions uh, every day. We basically are free to um, uh, make our, uh, uh, to, to decide what our percept is at any time. So in more recent, uh, recent work, um, in collaboration with Drak uh, Drokovitz and um, Alex Pouget, we have actually now done the same uh, behavior. And these are human data. We have also done this in, in monkeys. Um, we have now done this identical task, but now we ask the subjects to report their uh, uh, perception as soon as they thought, as soon as they were comfortable. And so this is um, the results. This is the threshold as a function of visual uh, coherence. I apologize because I switched the colors for you. So this is the green now is the vestibular threshold. Uh, blue is the visual threshold, and of course, as you decrease the uh, visual coherence, you increase um, uh, the, the threshold. And this uh, dashed line here is the prediction, the optimal prediction, and the solid red line is what we found experimentally. And as you can see, in this case, the subjects no longer follow the optimal prediction. In fact, the uh, actual thre combined thresholds are much higher uh, than what would have been predicted based on what I told you so far. The difference here is that, of course, now when we ask the animal um, to make a free choice, uh, then we um, have to take into account the uh, sensory evidence accumulation. I will not bore you with the details. Uh, but uh, um, Jean, uh, who is a postdoc with Alex Pouget, uh, derived the equations of how should now uh, what should be the optimal way to combine the signals when we take into account not just the precision, but also the reaction times. And these are fits of the models uh, of the model he developed uh, to a, a example data. Just to summarize now the average results, this is the same that I showed you before. The only difference is that now the prediction is different. And we can see that uh, the theta are um, uh, now the, the uh, actual behavior of the subjects was uh, predicted uh, by uh, the updated model, where, which takes into account both the precision and the reaction times. But um, at this point, I would like now to move to the second part of my talk. I spent um, most of my time up to now telling you that um, Multisensory uh, integration is important functionally because it can increase the signal to noise. But now I'm going to um, tell you also that multisensory integration is potentially very important because typically single sensory signals are ambiguous. And the ambiguity I'm going um, to illustrate is uh, also again during navigation. As we try to navigate in the world, we need to not only know which way we are going, but also how other objects like cars or people move relative to us. And uh, in fact, the uh, visual system um, has an ambiguity in that respect uh, because we know from previous li literature that heading judgments from optic flow are biased by moving objects. And similarly, the, perce the perception of the object motion can be biased by self-motion. Um, 
and the visual system on, on its own cannot correct it. So we hypothesize that actually the vestibular signals might be very important in solving this ambiguity. So I'm going to spend the next final slides illustrating this. Um, so this is the heading task that I, I presented previously. This is a heading direction that is uh, forward and to the left. But now there is a huge object, and again, you can see these effects with smaller objects, but this is what we use when we record from neurons to activate um, the visual uh, responses. Um, so when, what happens when now there is a, an object moving um, leftward is, uh, um, I, is going, I'm going to show in the next <laughs> slide. So this is the case of a leftward moving object. This is the case of the rightward moving object. Again, this is proportion rightward choices as a function of the direction of heading, the same as before, uh, but now the only difference is the moving objects. And what I want you to appreciate is the fact that now when we measure the behavior, and this is again humans, we actually see huge biases which are uh, specific to the direction of uh, the moving object. This is the visual stimulus condition. I was very surprised to find out that when the subjects did the task without optic flow, they were also very biased, in fact, even more. But now, very surprisingly, when we um, do this, um, uh, when we measure this perception uh, with both stimuli together, then we see that the bias uh, disappears. And this is just summary data um, to, uh, to illustrate this point without object, there is no bias. Um, with um, a rightward object, there is a leftward bias with uh, uh, the reverse being true for um, the leftward object. And again, I want to highlight the difference in the visual stimulus condition, how much it improves uh, when uh, vestibular signals are present. Uh, in addition, uh, we, uh, if really objects can um, distort uh, heading perception, maybe also self-motion can also distort object motion perception. And so um, we uh, asked humans now to do an object motion discrimination task while they were, going, uh, they were being moved to the right or to the left. The object motion discrimination was down and to the left or down and to the right. And I'm going to show you this. Um, uh, this is a downward movement of the object. And you can see very easily, you, oh, you can get confused that it, it appears uh, that it moves uh, down and to the left of the, of your, as you are sitting. Um, so again, to summarize the behavior, this is, um, there is no bias in the object motion task, but when uh, there is self motion, there are um, direction specific biases. And again, these biases are induced um, in the combined stimulus conditions. So um, these behavioral results show that in real world situations, when we move, when we navigate in the world in the presence of other objects that move relative to us, then uh, large biases can be introduced if we only consider single um, uh, sensory signals by themselves. Uh, but these biases are reduced during combined visual vestibular stimulation. So what are the neural correlates? So um, now I want to go back to the beginning of my talk to uh, remind you these opposite cells, uh, these opposite cells. So I told you in the beginning of my talk that we think that congruent cells are, uh, uh, might represent the neural sub substrate to improve heading discrimination. Now what I'm going to claim is that these opposite cells might in fact be optimized to be able uh, to encode object motion uh, and thus separate this ambiguity. And Pichuri, I want to highlight the fact that these two groups of cells are actually, th there is a bimodal distribution of the difference in preferred directions, suggesting that neurons tend to be opposite and or tend to be congruent, and it's not a uniform representation. So we hypothesize that congruent and opposite cells might play differential and complementary roles in um, uh, navigation for self-motion and object motion uh, judgments. And um, uh, to do this, and this is work in progress, um, uh, work in Rochester, actually, this is in the lab of my colleague uh, uh, Greg DeAngelis, 
uh, we've recorded from neurons in area MST to different directions of self-motion and different directions of object motion. And we then investigated whether tuning to self-motion remains invariant for different directions of object motion and vice versa. And I'm only going to show you one summary um, to illustrate uh, this point. This is my uh, last uh, data slide. So uh, I'm going to use an index, which is called the Direction Discrimination Index, which represents, uh, it's a measure of the quality of the tuning curves, how much variability there is for the different stimulus conditions. And then I'm going to separate the, the data into um, DDI measured for heading direction tuning and for object direction tuning. And each plot will compare the DDI in the combined condition versus the DDI in the visual condition. And I'm starting with uh, the heading because this is not surprising what you will expect. The blue are congruent cells. You see the DDI uh, increase. Large DDI means good, means good, uh, uh, less variability. And it's not surprising because this uh, result agree with what I showed you in the first part of my talk that congruent cells become better tuned uh, in the combined stimulus condition compared to the visual stimulus condition. In contrast, opposite cells become worse. But now when we look at the object direction tuning curves, we see the reverse. In fact, we see that opposite cells become better tuned to object motion direction and congruent cells become less tuned. So as I mentioned before, this is preliminary data. So just to summarize, uh, I've, I hope I've uh, persuaded you that uh, at least for congruent multisensory cells, um, combining cues together uh, can Im improve the heading, the self-motion um, uh, perception and the uh, tuning, uh, in but it will disrupt object motion tuning. In contrast, uh, I hope, at least I have given you a, a glimpse at what the function of opposite cells might be. Uh, we um, uh, have seen evidence that, in fact, addition of vestibular cues help opposite cells stabilize object motion. And uh, uh, thus, we propose that visual vestibular integration can create a more robust representation of uh, self-motion in congruent cells and a more robust representation of object motion in opposite multisensory cells. And uh, just to remind you what I started uh, from, um, these are two functions, two benefits, two benefits of multisensory integration that we have studied in the visual and the vestibular system uh, in a task related to navigation. But we think that it might be uh, more uh, broadly uh, applicable. And of course, this is the group of all uh, the people uh, whose work I presented today. Most importantly, uh, my long-term colleague and friend, and friend Greg DeAngelis, uh, we overlapped uh, at Washington University many years ago. We are now apart for six or seven, but we continue the collaboration. And these are all the young people uh, who did um, all the work I presented. Thank you so much. I'm very interested in uh, what happens if you provide uh, conflict information to the animal. If the monkey sees very conflict vestibular and visual input, what would the congruent or opposite cells respond and what would be, what would be the behavior? So, so we, we did this. In fact, uh, I went very quickly through that. But to measure the perceptual weights, you put the cues in conflict because then you see whether the psychometric function shifts towards one cue or towards the other cue. So when the conflict, the special conflict, is small enough below um, perceptual, um, uh, below conscience uh, understanding, then um, the, the behavior basically follows the most reliable cue. And this is what this linear weighted sum equation indicates that whatever uh, uh, signal has the smallest sigma, that will be the one that will dominate the behavior. 
Uh, and this is what happens with uh, both congruent and opposite cells. Now, what is interesting is what happens when the conflict is larger. Um, and we have done this also. Uh, I did not present uh, the data and it's not published. So when the conflict is large, then you reach a point that you cannot fool the brain any longer. The brain knows that uh, uh, the two different stimuli do not come from the same source. And this um, can also be studied using statistical inference, and it's called causal inference. And this happens all the time, again, in everyday life, when you hear a voice and you see a person, you don't automatically merge the two. You, you use some uh, sort of inference to figure out what is the probability that these two signals come from the same source. And this is a whole different story we have not recorded from neurons yet. So I cannot tell you what happens in the case of bigger conflict. We have not found anything uh, to separate them. Uh, <coughs> working on the uh, working uh, with the mindfulness, and as you know, we are working with working on the mindfulness. If we find them, the rodent now, of course, now we can start asking uh, some of these questions. Physiologically, we don't see a difference. They have similar receptive fields. Um, they are um, uh, found in the same penetration, sometimes next to each other. So we have not seen, um, a, but this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons to do rodent experiments in parallel now, because we can ask some of these questions. We don't even know if they go to the same area. Mark Marchioni, on the Accelerated Cure Project. So your vestibular uh, stimulus seems fairly mild. In my own personal experience, taking a sextant reading on a pitching boat is much less reliable than doing it in calm seas. So, I mean, have you tried, say, doing um, rocking of this? <coughs> so we use, we use the maximum. You're absolutely right. In fact, if we had a, big, a bigger machine than what we have, and gave bigger uh, accelerations, probably to match the sensitivity, we will have to use much higher visual coherences than we uh, did in this experiment. So the stimuli we use for the vestibular is the maximum um, that this platform can, um, can generate. Um, so that's, why, that's one of the reasons we didn't vary the reliability of uh, of the vestibular stimulus. But uh, my suspicion will be that, uh, th that uh, it depending on the dynamics of the actual uh, movement, uh, then sometimes the vestibular signals can be much more reliable than the visual. Hi, I'm Shin Kira from Harvard. Um, if I understand correctly, um, for the soft motion case, the congruent, congruent cells encode the information better. And for the, when the object is moving, incongruent cells encode the information better. And um, so how does the downstream neurons know, we, know uh, which neuron to listen to when we, it's? We do not know where the downstream neurons are, unfortunately. So um, we have been trying to record from, uh, from different areas. So many areas in the cortical, in the broader parietal uh, cortex of the monkey uh, have similar properties, including the area in the ventral intraparietal sulcus, areas in the uh, lateral sulcus close to um, uh, what is known as the parietoinsular vestibular cortex. So, we see the information widely represented throughout uh, different areas in the cortex, but we do not know where, where the output cell is, if there is an output cell. So if you go to the intraparietal sulcus, we see neurons in that area have very strong perceptual responses, what is known strong choice-related activity. Um, so one can say that perhaps the intraparietal sulcus, or perhaps even the prefrontal cortex that we have not recorded from, 
can represent the output, but we really do not uh, know. And that's, uh, in my opinion, one of the big problems of, syst of uh, systems neuroscience because we can, uh, does the brain listen to one area or to many areas? So we do, I cannot answer your question, unfortunately. So this multimodal integration that you're showing us, is it uh, low level or highly cognitive? It's a uh, low level. So um, that's why we see all of these signals in area MST, which has very little choice related activity. So we think it's a low level pro uh, property. What I mentioned previously about the causal inference, we think that's a high level property, um, but again, we do not know because we have not done the recording studies yet. So you would expect that memory would not actually allow for the interaction. If you, if you present one cue first not and the in other this cue task. later, you would destroy the... N not in MST. Not based on what we have seen in MST. Behaviorally? But What's your question exactly? If you present one, one modal cue uh -huh. first, which must be remembered, and then the other modal cue, so Would humans, you have the multimodal integration? Yeah. Uh, in humans, we have done that. Uh, you mean uh, two interval tasks? Yes, uh, you, you still see it. So that short-term memory does not really affect uh, affect. 